night as a nine-year-old child. I used to take a flashlight and shine it through my hand and look at it un under my covers. And it, it just fascinates me that this is something that actually penetrates us and it penetrates our environment. And, and collectively, we've lost that. And what I'm optimistic about is I think we're regaining it. I think we're beginning to see that this ubiquitous light that we have is impactful on our biology, our physiology, our, our environment. And I think that will provide us a number of solutions to a number of ailments as we go forward. It's been known for more than 100 years that uh, UVC light is very, very good at killing uh, bacteria and viruses both. And it's been used in, in many contexts over the last many decades. We had located all of the TB sanitariums in the United States in the sunniest parts of the city. Um, and you said, why? And, and we were told because the sun rays kill tuberculous bacilli. But in fact, what I learned when I started reading Dr. Brenner's work was that it is UVC, a specific component, not UVA or UVB, but UVC that is best for viruses and bacteria, and that most of the UVC is filtered out by the ozone layer. But a specific part, that is the UVC, you can generate in a lamp and the amazing thing is how fast it killed viruses. For example, in my own hospital's operating room, overnight these UVC lights are turned on and overnight they kill all the uh, bacteria and viruses and by the morning you've got a nice clean room, which is great. Uh, but of course, what happens then? Well, people uh, come into that operating room and bring their own uh, bugs and pathogens into that room. So it's very good for cleaning any room, but uh, what you'd really like is something that continuously cleans that room while people are there. We cough and we sneeze and we shout and, uh, and we sing, and that produces uh, viruses in the air. And they're, they're all contained within droplets or aerosols. And the bigger ones actually drop to the ground within a few seconds and within a few feet. And that's, that's the reason why we have our six feet social distancing rule. Um, but the smaller ones don't. The smaller ones start floating around in the air and they can stay uh, in the air and the viruses inside those aerosols can stay living for uh, hours, li literally. So really what we want to do is, is be able to just reduce the ambient level of virus that's in the air in a group setting when people are around. And the problem there is that we've also known for a long time that you can't directly expose people to conventional germicidal UVC light because that would be a health hazard both to the eyes and to the skin. So really where we came into the story was to think, is there a type of UV light which we can use which would have the same killing properties, uh, virus and bacteria both, as conventional germicide UV light, but wouldn't have the safety issues. And would that be the case, then you could actually use it directly when people are around. And what we came up with, oh, it's now seven or eight years ago, was a particular wavelength of UV light that we call far UVC light. Other people call it different things, but it's around 220 nanometers in wavelength. And conventional germicidal UV light is about 250. You might think that's a pretty trivial difference, 220 to 250, but actually it makes a world of difference. Because what happens at these low wavelengths is that the UV light is actually absorbed in the outer layers of our skin, the dead layers of our skin. You know, on the surface of our skin, we have dead cells. The technical term is a stratum corneum, but it's, it's a few layers of, of dead cells. And this far UVC light, other, as opposed to conventional UV light, simply can't penetrate through this dead cell layer. So it can't reach the living cells in our skin. And it's the same story with the eye. Right on the very surface of the eye is a so-called tear layer. And this far UVC light gets absorbed in, in the tear layer. So again, it can't reach the, the critical parts of our eye, the, the top part being the cornea. So it's safe. You can actually use it in rooms where people are actually hanging out and, and uh, doing whatever they're doing without it being a safety issue. And that's the big difference between far UVC light and conventional germicidal UV light, that you can use it when people are around. This has been around for a decade plus. 
Uh, it has been worked on for, for longer than that. I, I was exposed to it you know, 13, 14 years ago when uh, it was installed on a piece of equipment over at NASA. So it, it's been there. It's been discussed. But the um, thoughts of folks to listen to it was not quite as imperative as, as it has become today. And as anything, it is now being pushed into that, into that foreground. But um, again, David has done uh, amazing work uh, advocating for it and studying it. And um, we need some more people to start listening. In terms of safety, I mean, there are three approaches. We've got the, the physics of the matter, we've got the regulatory framework, and we've got a lot of experimental uh, studies now. So what one is the pure physics of the matter. The fundamental thing about far UVC light is that it cannot penetrate into the living skin or into the living eye. Second one is that there are actually a whole bunch of regulations that have been in place for the last couple of decades from a quasi-government organization called ICGIH, but there are also international uh, regulations too. And that basically tells you what level of uh, UV light at any particular wavelength the general public or workers can be exposed to per day or per hour. And all the manufacturers, including Healthy, are going to stay within those uh, regulatory limits. And then the third part of the story is the research in terms of safety. Over the last seven or eight years now, there have been lots and lots of studies uh, nationally, internationally on safety, both short-term studies where you expose to, to high doses of far UVC and then look pretty quickly to see if you see any effects. But also, for example, there's a long-term study that's going on at Columbia where we've been exposing hairless mice for just about a year now to actually quite high levels of far UVC light continuously, so eight hours a day, five days a week. And we examined those mice every couple of weeks, both for any skin issues or any eye issues. And uh, now just about one year into that study, absolutely nothing. We don't see any skin issues. We don't see any eye issues compared with the control mice in the adjacent room that uh, don't get any UV light exposure. In medicine, we use broad UV at night in our operating rooms and in our regular hospital rooms to cleanse them and clean them. But it's always been thought this is too dangerous for eye and skin to be used regularly. And so David's really groundbreaking research showing that this set of wavelength, 205 to 222, was in fact safe for humans, has really been uh, enormously important. This is not your grandfather's UVC. We grew up being taught to stay away from UV. Slather yourself in sunscreen. This is a whole different wavelength, and that difference of only 23, 24 nanometers makes a world of difference on how our biological uh, selves interact with it. And in fact, it, it does not penetrate us. It, it is not the same as we have seen with, with UVC before. So uh, we have to get that differentiated message out. We were really interested in influenza. Influenza is a major issue and influenza is transmitted primarily by airborne routes. And we were working on asking the question, can 5UVC light kill influenza virus? So we'd been working on that for several years. Come the start of the COVID crisis, there was a light bulb moment where we saw pretty well immediately that what we were doing in the influenza world was absolutely applicable to the SARS-CoV-2 virus because I think it was pretty clear to most people that really this was an airborne transmitted problem. And I think we now know that's actually the case. So it was pretty easy for us to switch our attentions from uh, influenza virus to SARS-CoV-2 virus. And pretty quickly, we were able to show that 5UVC light is indeed very good at killing these coronaviruses. I think we have known for some years that things like this were possible. We've been talking to people about it for uh, you know, over a decade now. So I think we had a, a very good knowledge base to draw from, and we had, you know, from our side, had already had products in the market that were capable of dealing with it. Uh, I think what COVID did is it really activated us to embrace how far we could take the science and how far we can push it uh, to understand what it would do to potentially disrupt this pathogen from wreaking the havoc it, it has wreaked. Um, and I think we are, we are well within the, the bounds of this being able to deal with a good chunk of that. It is part of a solution, though. It's not a complete solution, but it is part of a way to make our environment a healthier and safer one for us to occupy. The first tests that we did were with uh, different coronaviruses, which we were able to aerosolize and then show that far UVC light could kill them. 
but subsequently, uh, actually several groups now have demonstrated that far UVC light is very efficient at killing the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's a 99% kill rate over 15 minutes. This is all ultimately about uh, a calculation that we call fluids, and that is uh, how much light over what period of time, over what distance has to be transposed to, to inactivate a, a given pathogen. Um, all pathogens have slightly different dosings based on uh, the size of their RNA or their DNA or essentially what makes up the target area we're trying to hit. Um, and there's good documentation on what pathogens require what levels of fluence to be inactivated. So um, it, it is all time, distance, and power dependent. And if we trigger any one of those three legs, uh, we change the others. We don't have long-lasting immunity from some of these viruses. So with the coronaviruses that cause colds, we can get them every two to three months, which means we don't have long-lasting immunity against the general coronavirus. Once you have this in, you don't have to worry about the next generation of viruses or mutations in the viruses. One sort of fundamental difference between this approach and an approach like a vaccine, for example, is this is one size fits all, that uh, the far UVC light or UVC light in general kills all bacteria and viruses, whereas of course a vaccine is very, very specific. So what we're doing here is preparing us for upcoming influenza seasons, but it's also preparing us for any new pandemic, which will no doubt appear within our lifetimes. Uh, we'll be ready next time around. So we don't have to change anything as the, uh, the pathogen or, or the virus changes, we're, we'll, we'll be ready. Unlike uh, pharmaceuticals uh, to, to treat these pathogens, uh, using light uh, as a countermeasure uh, does not create the drug resistant strains we're seeing uh, where other pharmaceuticals have been applied in the past. So this gives us a much more direct approach in how we inactivate the, these viruses and pathogens, uh, but also doesn't create the, the, the downside of what's happened with pharmaceuticals in the past. This particular pathogen we're, we're concerned about can be inactivated fairly quickly at fairly low power levels and it is an air-based one in terms of how it is being communicated between us and the ability to clean that in real time and, and deal with air that's not having to be drawn through an HVAC filter but in real time and in real space it is a strong differentiator. We now have just one more tool in the battle against the transmission of COVID-19. And really, we have so few tools. We have masks and we have social distancing, but we really don't have much else. And I see this as a third tool in the big fight. When we're in a space, when we're occupying that space, uh, we don't want to have to evacuate it to clean it. Uh, we want to be able to reutilize that space in real time, whether that's a, a dressing room of a retail shop, whether that's a conference room in an office building. Uh, the fact that this is cleaning both air and has some surface cleaning as well affects to it. That gives us the ability to, to dynamically utilize a space and to be continually reducing that, that viral and pathogen load in that space as we're inhabiting it. I think that's a, a strong differentiation between this and pretty much any of the technologies that are being discussed. The Miami Dolphins are using a number of these in their locker room, um, both with air filtration and with the light, protecting the players from the pathogens from viruses. One of the issues is that over the past few years when we worked on it, there really hadn't been a large-scale source of these lamps. And really, it's only since the beginning of COVID-19 that uh, various manufacturers, Healthy certainly being uh, one of the major ones, has really stepped up to the plate in terms of production. So had you asked three years ago, you know, can you install this in the Miami Dolphins locker room? The answer would have been no, because the, the lamps really didn't uh, exist in large numbers. And we could buy lamps in very small numbers, you know, ones and twos and threes to do research. But in terms of uh, the large numbers that obviously we would like to use, they didn't exist at that point. We are continuing to introduce new products that utilize this technology. Um, for instance, this is one that could be used in various settings. It could be used in hospitals, but it could also be used in homes or offices. It has both an optical light that could be circadian tuned or tuned to any other biological function we might be interested in, but also has an element on it that's a far UVC emitter. And that far UVC emitter can be turned on or off based on occupancy, based on time and, and various thresholds of exposure. And that's all programmed in a light that could simply be turned on and off with a light switch. The power supplies that go into the units uh, physically are, are multi-volt power supplies. They, they can be used anywhere in the world, uh, anything from 90 volts to 277 volts or even higher if need be. So there's no limitation that that power is converted and transformed inside the unit to be a power that's useful to the unit itself. So the location in the world this exists should have no bearing on how it operates.
And so if you can imagine that it fit in this form factor, it can be used fairly ubiquitous. And that's the path of what they were going down. There, there will be quite a few new products coming out. Um, and there are a number that are already in the marketplace and shipping today. Offices, homes, uh, recreation areas, uh, all, all possible today already. We could have this in our emergency rooms. We could have this between us and our patients and stop the worry about medical professionals. And even since Dr. Brenner's work showed it wasn't dangerous for eyes or skin, the worries about the broad UVC wavelength, but having a specific one, then you could actually have this on in our ICUs and really decrease transmission. And so that's what got me really excited about this technology. I think this is going to be seen in so many areas. I think the health spa, any, any places where people tend to congregate and potentially shopping malls, office buildings, or around the coffee pot to start with. I, th- I think we're going to look at sort of those higher concentration areas first. I think as it becomes uh, more and more available and more and more accessible, we'll see uh, quite a few additional application spaces, but the, the technology is also going to evolve into ways that it becomes more applicable and, and more friendly in certain areas. We're looking today at sort of the, the first phase of what this is today, and that's dealing with the problems we have today. Um, this may just be a practice uh, for the next pandemic and how we build this into our environment to make it more resilient uh, to these pathogens occurring uh, is going to be critical for how we move forward, and we'll devise and design uh, new form factors to accomplish that. 